catch the ball. You gotta catch that. Um, I, I know it's the playoffs, but can I talk to you for a moment? Sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like the amount of time that you have spent watching football has been detrimental to the amount of quality interaction time that we have with our children. Um, it, okay. okay. It's just, it makes the kids and I feel kind of, um... Unwanted. Yes, exactly. I had no idea that my actions were causing you to feel this way. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. I sincerely apologize for my selfishness, and I humbly ask for your forgiveness. I forgive you. Well, grab the kids. Let's do some arts and crafts. Catch the ball! Stick it! We had to wait until the week after the Super Bowl to show this one. Uh, if you're new here, welcome to Hope. My name is Jason. I'm the lead pastor on staff, and I'm so glad you decided to spend your Sunday morning with us at Hope Church. And I'm glad you're here for this series. It's something that I, I believe is a very important series that is going to be helpful. We're talking about families and how to navigate our real families. And because uh, for all of us, uh, what our real family situation is probably isn't what you visualize in your mind when it comes to what you wish family could be. In fact, if you missed last week, here's what we talked about last week. We said that there's a gap between your real and ideal family. When in your mind you visualize what would your ideal family look like, what would your ideal marriage look like, what would your ideal parent-child relationship look like, what would your ideal relationship look like with the in-laws, how would holidays work, you've got your own vision in mind of what the ideal family would look like. But as we're going to see in this series, God also has an ideal vision for what your family would look like. Because God's the one who designed family in the first place. When God kind of created everything and set everything in order, he thought to himself, now what's the ideal way for all of this to function? And his solution was, the idea is family. And I've got an ideal version and standard of what family could and should look like. But the reality is for all of us, because we're all at very diverse places when it comes with our family relationships, no matter who you are, there is a gap that exists between your real family and your ideal family. The question becomes, how do you fill in that gap? What do you do about it? Now, for most of us, the first solution is to fight. We just fight about it because, well, if you would, and if you wouldn't, and if you would just start, and if you would just stop, and if you two would stop yelling, this would all be fine. So we start fighting about people who aren't living up to our ideal expectations. But give it enough years, we realize that's not getting us anywhere. So what most of us end up doing is compromising. We just compromise, we start to normalize, hey, every family is this way, you think my family's bad, you should see this guy I work with, his family is jacked up, okay, so we're doing all right, and we just take the dysfunction in our lives, and we settle for it, and we compromise, and we normalize it, and there is a big push in society to just normalize dysfunctional family dynamics, but the problem with that, that we covered last week, is this, nothing brings joy into your life like healthy family relationships, and nothing brings pain or sorrow into your life like unhealthy family relationships. So it's important that we figure out what to do with this gap that exists for all of us. So last week we said, well, what happens when you turn to God with this gap? And here was our big takeaway from last week. Jesus took the standard higher and the grace deeper. When it comes to ideal family situations and our failure to live up to them, what did Jesus do with that gap? He did two things. One, he took the standard higher. See, you're only measuring family from what you think is ideal. God's standard of an ideal family is even higher than yours. His expectations, his desires, his hopes and dreams for your family are even higher than your hopes and dreams. But even though Jesus took the standard higher, he also took the grace deeper. And anytime anybody came to him, 
with brokenness or shame or sin or embarrassment when it came to personal relationships and family, Jesus did not condemn them. He gave his life for them. He took the grace deeper. Jesus said, I want the standard higher, but I'm taking the grace deeper. So no matter how big the gap is and no matter how many times you've blown it with your family, God does not condemn you. God wants you to fearlessly strive towards the ideal family because when you fail, he's there and he will forgive you. Now, that's what we covered last week. And so uh, my only goal last week was that all of us would just make the determination. Number one, I'm going to pursue my ideal family because God is with me and he does not condemn me. And two, no throwing elbows anytime during the series. Those are my only two goals for last week. Now today, we're going to turn our attention very specifically towards parenting, towards raising children. And although we're all, again, in different seasons of life when it comes to parenting, uh, I think this is going to be helpful for everyone, and here's why. When you look at what the biblical authors wrote about relationships, parenting relationships, spousal relationships, boss-employee relationships, neighbor relationships, friend relationships, here's what's fascinating. What they understood is that the same set of basic principles apply to all of your human relationships. The applications look different depending on the nature of the relationship, but the underlying principles those applications are built on, they're the same in every single human relationship you have. So while today I'm very specifically talking to those of us who are elbow deep in diapers and can't make a walk to the bathroom without stepping on Legos, the principles we're talking about today absolutely have applications for everyone. So if your kids have already left the house, this will still help you in your relationship with your adult kids. If you haven't had any kids but you're hoping to someday, this will help you get it right the first time. And, and if you're never going to have kids, this will just make it easier for you to judge all of us who do it poorly, okay? So there's something for everyone in this series, but at least you'll be judging them for the right reason now. So here's the reason why when it comes to parenting, there's a gap between your ideal and your real family. Parenting requires more than you have. I thought someone would have said amen, but you're all too tired to say that at this point. Parenting requires more time than you have. It does. Parenting requires more wisdom than you have. Parenting requires more patience than you have. Parenting requires more stubbornness than you have. Your kids don't think so, but it's true. It does. Parenting requires more flexibility than you have. Parenting requires more than you have. As a pastor, talking with people from every stage of life, I have yet to meet a parent who has already raised their kids who does not have regrets. I have yet to meet that person. As a pastor who converses with people who are currently knee-deep in it, I have yet to meet a parent who is currently raising children who doesn't already have regrets about the very way they're raising their children right now. And the reason for that is because parenting requires more than we have. So this is an area where we are keenly aware of the gap that exists between our real family and our ideal family. Now the challenge in talking about the topic of parenting today is simple. There are so many different approaches and philosophies when it comes to raising kids, aren't there? In fact, uh, when I look around the world today, there are already more approaches and philosophies to raising kids than when my kids were little, and and my oldest is only a freshman in high school, and we've already seen this next generation after me come up and adopt even newer and different philosophies. So I want to give a quick overview of some of the parenting philosophies that we see in our world today, And, and as I go through these, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be one or two where you're going to say, that's the right one, that's how everyone should do it. You're going to see a couple of more where you say, I can see why people would do that. And then you're going to see one where you're going to say, those people are idiots. All right, so just so you know. But the fun thing is it's going to be different for all of us, but you like to judge the way other people raise kids. The reason why you approach the parenting philosophy you do has to do with your upbringing. I mean, the research is clear. The way you were raised has more impact on your bias and worldviews than anything else in that, that there is. It has to do with your worldview, your experiences, what you've read, what you've seen. For some of us, it's copying what our parents did. For some of us, it's correcting from what our parents did. But there are some different approaches that we see to parenting at work in our world today. So, uh, here's the next idea. Parenting is hard, so some people take the wine mom approach, Okay. Now, what started as a funny meme in 2015 with Wine Mom has worried psychologists because it's quickly become almost a subculture of parenting. It really has. In fact, uh, 
it has become embraced and evangelized by some marketers as a way to approach parenting. Um, in fact, there's a new label of wine called Mommy Juice. Have you seen this one out there? Maybe you've seen another one called Mommy's Time Out. So, so two real, we did not make this up. This is a real wine label and an approach. The idea is kids won't sleep at night. Throw a temper tantrum in Target again. There's a juice for that. Okay, so, so of course the concern is self-medicating rather than equipping ourselves. But that's okay, joke aside. What are the actual approaches we see to parenting today? First one is this, tiger parents. Tiger parents are the parents who have very high expectations for their children. These are the people who have every single 15-minute block of the schedule planned. They have sky-high expectations for academics, for athletics. There's no leisure time. There's no downtime. It's go, 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 and very high expectations. Now, some people adopt this approach. Critics of this approach say it induces a performance-based mindset in the children. So if they don't live up to mom and dad's extreme expectations, then they will feel no sense of self-worth. But that's the tiger parent approach. The opposite of that are elephant parents. Elephant parents are very nurturing. It is all about nurturing the relationship. Uh, many times for elephant parents, uh, there is co-sleeping until the age of three or four. Perhaps kids don't become independent sleepers until the age of five. Everything is nurturing. Everything is surrounding. Uh, there are, and there's critics to every single approach uh, to parenting. Uh, critics of, of this approach will say, you know, it creates codependency and doesn't let the children become uh, autonomous at all. A uh, third style of parenting we see today are free-range parents. These are the parents who grant a very high degree of autonomy and decision-making to their children. These are the ones, you know, this is what used to be just kind of normal America where, you know, go out and come home when the streetlights come on in the summertime. Uh, these are parents who say, yeah, go to the store by yourself, ride public transportation by yourself. They just say, you know, kids need to go figure out life, so they give them the autonomy to do that. Critics of this approach say it can endanger the children by putting them in situations where the parents can't keep an eye on them. A uh, fourth approach to parenting we see today is wabi-sabi parents uh, from a Japanese phrase which loosely translated into English means to find beauty in the imperfection. To find beauty in the imperfection. The rest of us just call these the whatever parents. They, just, they have a very high tolerance for whatever. Um, and that's kind of their approach to life. So, you know, it's, it's the parent who says, hey, it's a mess, it's chaos, uh, you know, the house is in turmoil, whatever. That's just the season of life we're in. Embrace the season of life. Embrace the beauty of the imperfection that we see in this season of life. Now, uh, I only mention this because this is in the news recently. I'm not saying anything one way or another. But parents who delay or don't want to vaccinate their children usually fall into the category of wabi-sabi or of elephant parents. And the rationale is we don't want anything impure to violate the beautifully imperfect purity of our child the way that he or she is. So that's just part of the thinking that leads people to those decisions in life. Uh, critics of this particular approach uh, are the ones who say you, you appear to be inattentive to what's going on in the life of your child. Um, could you please at least clean the boogers off their face before they play in the playland for the sake of the other children? Another approach we see to parenting today are the helicopter parents. Now, these took off these took off in the 1990s, um, kind of that approach to parenting where the adults are always hovering. They're always involved in the life of their kids. They're always close by. They're always helping the child assess risk. They're always helping the child make decisions. Uh, the critics of this approach would say that it never teaches the children how to adult and figure things out on their own. It's kind of the opposite of free-range parents. Uh, but the helicopter parents have given rise, given rise to a new breed of parents, and this has really cropped up in the last five to ten years, and that's the lawnmower parents. Uh, lawnmower parents are the parents who go in front of their kids and mow down any obstacles in their path. These are the parents who their child's homework isn't done, they'll do it for them. These are the parents who, you, oh, you forgot your water bottle, let me run it over to you at soccer practice. You, you forgot something. These are the parents who don't want their children to experience unpleasant or uncomfortable situations. Now, critics of this approach say the problem is you're creating entitled children who will become entitled adults and children who are not ready to deal with the complexities and pain of real life. If they never have to deal with adversity while they're young, then how are they going to learn to deal with adversity 
in life. So there's all these different approaches to parenting, and these are broad categories. You might say there's one or two you identified with, or might say there's one or two where those are the wrong way to do it. The problem is, when you're in the thick of parenting, it is easy to lose sight of the forest for the trees. When you are raising kids, the days are long. The days are so long that the mommy juice at the end of the day looks like a real attractive option. The days are long and we get caught up with trying to navigate through the busyness of today. The days are long, but what we can lose sight of is the fact that the years are short. And when these children leave home, at that point, what do we want for our children? At that point, who do we want them to be? At that point, what do we want them to know? And we get so caught up in day-to-day and what's my approach and why is my approach good and I read it on a blog or I saw it on the television show that I watch. We get so caught up in the here and now, it's easy to lose sight of the destination. What's the destination that we want our kids to arrive at? And instead of losing sight of the forest for the trees, we keep that end goal in mind. Now, here's what's fascinating. Researchers have have determined that basically every single approach to parenting has its own pros and cons. However, they they are very, I'm just going to say this, they're very concerned about lawnmower parents because we're not sure where that leads. They're concerned it's not going to lead to good places. But generally speaking, whatever your approach, whatever your parenting philosophies are, they all have pros and cons. But a 19-year research project that concluded in 2015, and it was published in the American Journal of Psychiatric Health, said there are two traits, there are two skills, that if you can develop these two traits, these two skills in a five-year-old child, they are the most accurate predictor of future success in the life of that child. So they studied these five-year-old kids and they tracked them for 19 years. And what they learned is, the kids who have these two traits, who have these two skills, have a much higher ratio of college education, full-time employment, and stable lives. And those who did not have these two skills had much higher ratios of being dropouts, of being arrested, and of abusing alcohol or other substances. And the two skills are not writing or reading or arithmetic, or all the things that we prioritize when it comes to raising kids. There are two traits, there are two skills that if a five-year-old has, they're the highest predictor of success. You know what they are? I'm just making it tense, sorry. Um, Two things, social competence and emotional resilience. Social competence and emotional resilience. Social competence means I can have healthy interactions with other humans. I can share my toys. I can be an advocate for my own rights. I know how to respect and obey authority figures. I can have healthy friendships that are appropriate for my age. Social competence combined with emotional resilience. Emotional resilience means when things don't go your way, you can handle it emotionally. When things are difficult, you can handle it emotionally at an age-appropriate level. Children who have learned the skills of social competence, and I'm not talking about introvert or extrovert, just, you know, they have their own personality, but they can have healthy social interaction, and emotional resilience they can handle when life throws them a curveball. These are the most important predictors of success in adulthood. Now, I would add one that's a little more intangible, and the researchers don't really have a way to gauge it, but we're going to, in the course of the series, see why it's also a critical skill to have. I would add spiritual resilience. And the reason why, and I'll go into detail on this later in the series, is because spiritual resilience does more to bolster emotional resilience than anything I've ever seen. The ability spiritually to be strong gives strength to emotional resilience because someone who is spiritually resilient is firm in their conviction that even in this hardship, God is for me and God is with me and God has a good purpose for it in my life. That makes you more emotionally resilient. Adults who have these traits are the adults who, generally speaking, are the most successful or the happiest in life and adults who don't have these traits generally suffer the most 
through adulthood. So here's the question for parents. Are you so caught up in the day-to-day grind that you're losing sight of the preferred destination? Or here's the way I'm going to say it for the rest of the series. Good parents don't prepare the road for the child. They prepare the child for the road. Good parents don't try and make everything perfect and pleasant in the life of a child. Good parents prepare the child for the realities of the life and the future they are going to face because those are the children who grow into adults, and I'm just telling you what the research says, who are the happiest and most well-adjusted in the future. Now, to break this down, so okay, so Jason, that, that's good to know, but how do we begin to get a handle on this? And here's where we're going to start to make it practical for the rest of the series. The good news is, according to what the biblical authors taught us, and according to what a mountain of research evidence has confirmed, to produce kids who are spiritually and emotionally resilient and who have high social competence, there are only five areas of their lives you need to pay attention to. It's not to say the rest is unimportant, but there are five key factors in the life of a child that will dictate, virtually dictate the outcome in these two areas of life. Now, I want to be clear uh, because they are still independent humans and I have seen parents do everything right and their kid still turns out wrong. I've seen parents do everything wrong and somehow their kid turns out right. This is not an algebra equation, okay? But there are five key dashboard gauges to keep an eye on and we're going to break these down for the rest of the series. I call them the five C's of parenting. These are the five areas to keep an eye on when it comes to developing people who are socially and emotionally healthy. Here they are. First one is this, care. In other words, you provide for the health and well-being of the child. I'm not going to go real deep into this one in this series. You can talk to your pediatrician on that. But it's not just you know, physical well-being. It's also the emotional well-being. Is the child loved? Is the child provided for? Basic care is the first C. Second one is consistency. Is there environment one where it's a predictable and secure environment. Does dad respond to the ups and downs of life in a consistent way? Does mom handle this consistently or does she yell at me one day and ignore me the rest of the, uh, the rest of the time? My parents, do they love one another or do they always fight? Are they together or did they divorce? So the consistency of their home environment in which they live is critical for parenting. So we have care, we have consistency. Third one is choices. Choices. Is the child given permission to make age-appropriate decisions? And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this later in the series. Fourth one is consequences. Are there reasonable and natural consequences for the decisions the child makes? And then the last one is Christ. Do they know who Jesus is and what it means to have an identity as a child of God. So here's where we're going for the rest of the series. Care, like I said, you you can basically figure this one out with your pediatrician, okay? Or whatever blog you like to read. We're not going to really go there in the series. Today we're talking about consistency. How to create, and again, even if you don't have kids at home, this is just going to help you no matter where you're at in your life. Um, Do you have a consistent home environment for the kids? Next week, We're talking about choices and consequences. We are talking about discipline. So if you are struggling with discipline at home, if you and your spouse or if you and your ex-spouse are struggling with discipline and you're not on the same page, be here next week to talk about choices and consequences. If you have any neighbor kids who their parents struggle with discipline, bring it's a good week to invite a friend. That's all I'm going to say to, to hope next week because we are going to talk about choices and consequences. It's such an important topic uh, when raising kids. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about Christ. Some of you say, Jason, it's easy for you to talk about God in your home. You read the Bible for a living. What we're going to see is it's easy for anyone. It's easier than you think it is to build a Christ-centered home, again, no matter what your season of life is. So this is where we're going for the rest of the series. But today, we are talking about consistency. How do you build a consistent home environment in which children thrive and in which children develop social competence and emotional resilience. To help us with that today, we're going to uh, look at two places in the New Testament. Both of them are written by a man named Paul. And the reason why I love reading what Paul had to say about family and relationships is because he was a bachelor and he never had any kids. 
which means he didn't come in saying, well, I'll tell you how I do it. I mean, he's like, I'm just going to tell you God's principles. And he didn't, you know, drag his own biases into it, which is why I think what he said about relationships, and, and if you've ever heard me preach about marriage and relationships, romantic relationships, I go to Paul all the time because he was just so objective about it. Well, what he wrote today, the first part that we're going to look at, wasn't actually written specifically to parents because, like I said, the principles, they apply to any human relationship. But we're going to see how they revolutionize your thinking when it comes to raising kids. So we're going to get started in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, where Paul wrote, Do nothing. In other words, of all of your behaviors, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Now, ambition simply means, I just want to make a difference. I want to make a splash. Jesus never condemned ambition. The biblical authors never condemned ambition. What they condemned was selfish ambition. You want to make a big splash primarily and exclusively for your benefit. You want to make a difference in the world primarily and exclusively for your benefit. In other words, you are living with you at the center of your universe. Paul says, do nothing for that reason. It's not going to lead anywhere good. And contrary to what you think, you're not even going to left, be left fulfilled by it. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, uh, Paul wrote this in Greek because that's when he lived. That was the world he lived in. And if we translated this Greek word literally into English, it's terrible English, but liter a literal translation says glory emptiness. Glory emptiness. Do nothing out of glory emptiness. What does that mean? It means as human beings, we were made to experience glory, significance, importance. And the reason why is because we were made in the image of God. And in the image of God, we were made to live forever. And deep inside, we know that we were made to live forever. And we were made to live lives that matter. We were made to matter. But because we sin, because we're decaying, because we're dying, we realize we're running empty on glory. We're running empty on significance. We know we will die. We know at some point our lives will be forgotten. And there's this emptiness inside of us as human beings where we want to fill up on glory. We want to fill up on significance. Paul says, well, don't do things because you are desperate to fill up on glory. Do you know what glory-hungry people do? They try and squeeze significance out of anything and everyone who is around them in their lives. They might try and squeeze it out of accomplishments. They might try and squeeze it out of pleasure. They might try and squeeze it out of accolades. They might try and squeeze it out of fame. They might try and squeeze it out of popularity. And they will definitely try and squeeze it out of their closest relationships. I need to feel like I matter. I need to feel significant. So they will grab onto whatever they can and try and squeeze the significance and meaning in life out of whoever is around them. Some of you were raised by this kind of parent. It's exhausting. And if you raise kids this way, two things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to drive your kids away. And number two, it's going to fail. And the reason why it will fail, because if you have kids, here's what will happen. They will embarrass you in public many times. I don't care who you are, okay? Your kids will embarrass you in public. It's not going to work. So Paul says, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Don't do anything because you're glory empty. But, he said, here's what you should do. In humility, consider others better than yourself. So when you look around the room that you're in, I want you to think about everyone else being more important than you. When he says better than yourself, he doesn't mean that they have more skills than you. He says, you're more important than me. Treat every person you meet like they are an important dignitary. Like who they are as an individual has great significance and value. So he says, instead of doing something because you're so glory empty, treat others like they're way more important than you are. He continues. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, he's talking about selfish ambition, but also to the interests of others. 
In other words, every time you're in a conversation, every time you're in a room, no matter where you are, the question is, how can I serve you? How can I help you? How can I help you get to your deal? Because I'm considering you to be better than me. Now, the word that Paul used to describe this is the word humility. It's a misunderstand, misunderstood word, so I often try and define it when I'm talking about it. Uh, humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. So humility is not to be confused with low self-esteem. Totally different thing. Humility doesn't, doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. See, people who are glory empty lack humility because they're always thinking of themselves. People who have selfish ambition are always thinking of themselves. Paul says, instead of that, embrace humility, which doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. It means thinking of yourself less. It means I am emotionally resilient enough that I can think about you more than I think about me. That's all humility means. Now, when it comes to raising kids, what kind of difference would it have on a child's social competence? if they were raised in a home by parents who in every interaction treated other people like they're more important? What would it look like if a child grew up learning humility and whoever the child is interacting with, they view that person as being more important? What would that do to their social competence? We'd send it through the roof because they're always going to be respectful. They're always going to be considerate. And what would it do to someone's emotional resilience if things are not going well for you Instead of becoming so myopically focused on your hardships, they can look beyond themselves to see, but look at all the people around me, and their lives matter too. And some are suffering worse than I am. Some are doing better than I am, and I'm excited for them. But what would it do for their emotional resilience if they had humility? It would go through the roof. So Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or glory emptiness, but in humility, consider other people better than yourselves. Humility doesn't mean you have low self-esteem. It means you think about other people more. He continues, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. So here's the thing about Jesus, Son of God. You know what's true about Jesus, no matter what room he was in? He was the most important person in the room. Okay, when you're the Son of God, whenever you walk into a room, just so you know, you're the most important person in the room. I did kind of create the world. Pretty important. But he never walked into the restaurant and said, excuse me, uh, I'm going to need 13 chairs for me and my boys here. You guys need to move out because the most important person is here. He's always the most important person in the room. But what did he do? He did not consider equality with God that he rightly deserved, something he had to desperately cling to. Oh no, I need to be somebody. But instead he made himself nothing. This Greek word means empty. Empty. He emptied himself, not of being God, he emptied himself of his glory. And he took the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He said, I am God, I deserve to be served, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to serve. I'm going to walk into the earth and I'm going to treat everyone like they are more important than me. Even though I'm actually the most important person in the room. That's humility. Jesus never thought less of himself. He was very secure knowing he was the Son of God. But he thought about himself less and he thought about our needs more. Continues. And being found in appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself to the place where he said, your greatest need that you brought on yourself is you have alienated yourselves from God through your sin. You have ruined the glory in your life through your own sin, and it's your fault. But because I'm going to humble myself, I'm going to treat you like you're more important than me, so I'm going to do something about something, even though it's your fault. He humbled himself to forgive your sins, all the way to death on a cross. Therefore, because he humbled himself, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Who's the most important person? Jesus. God exalted him after his crucifixion. 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. There will be a day in the future when Jesus returns and every single knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There will be a day in the future when people loved him or hated him will be forced to acknowledge your Lord. They will be forced to bow before him, acknowledging he is truly great. Continues. Therefore, my dear friends, therefore, since Jesus humbled himself, since Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God, since Jesus will return in glory and everyone will acknowledge who he is. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. In other words, Paul planted this church. He went to plant more churches. He's writing them a letter to see how they're doing. He's not there with them, but they're still obeying God. He says, continue, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. He says, because you put your faith in Christ, because you're followers of Jesus, God is working in you now. And that's the amazing thing. When you become a Christian, God works in you and his power is working out in your life. What's it doing? It is God who works in you to will and to act according, in order to fulfill his good purpose. God works in you to will, in other words, to want, to desire, and to put it into practice, God's will and God's purpose for your life. And what is God's purpose for your life on earth? That you would be humble. That you would understand that life is not about me. See, here's a question every child asks and needs an answer to. They don't ask it in this way, but I'm going to pull back the curtain and help you understand what every single child asks. Am I God? Am I the center of the universe? Is everything and everyone in this life here to serve me? That's what they're asking. They don't ask it in that way, but that's what they're trying to figure out. Am I God? And if not, who is? Who is God? It's only when we embrace the greatness of Jesus Christ, His glory, His majesty, and His unfailing love for us that He displayed on the cross, and it's only when we look around and realize that I am only one of about seven and a half billion people on this planet that I realize how small I am. But being small is not the same as being insignificant. Because of the love of God, we have an identity in Christ. It's not high self-esteem thinking I'm awesome. That's selfish ambition. It's not low self-esteem saying I'm nothing. It's Christ esteem. I know I'm okay because God loves me. I know I'm okay because God made me and because God loved me enough to give his life for me. Now, when you have a mom and a dad who live with humility, who aren't running a house because they're glory empty, who aren't running a house out of selfish ambition, who aren't trying to squeeze meaning from their own lives out of their children, but a mom and a dad who can say, we follow Jesus because he's good, because he loves us, because he's in charge, because he's going to return. That provides a level of security emotionally and spiritually to the child's life that is unshakable. When mom and dad follow Jesus and embrace humility, we consider other people more important than ourselves, the kids learn humility. And humility is what leads to social competence and emotional resilience. Now, one more thing, because I have nowhere else to tag this on in this series, but in the end you'll see how it all fits together. Second thing Paul said, and this is the short one, don't worry. Second thing Paul said about creating kids, developing kids who are socially competent and emotionally resilient, comes from the book of Ephesians. And super simple here, he said, however, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Okay. Parents are never told by the biblical authors to love their children. Weird, isn't it? Do you know why? You do that intuitively. 
Because if you didn't, you, you'd probably just throw them out. But you love them, so, so you stick with them. But he says, when it comes to the family relationship, there's only one relationship within the family unit that was designed to reflect God's love for you, and that was the relationship between a husband and wife. The husband and wife enter a marriage covenant, just as God entered a covenant with you. And the covenant of God says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And that's why when God established marriage, he said the pattern you are to emulate is the pattern of my love for you. Now, kids, that's not a lifelong commitment. The good news is they do leave home someday. They become adults. They go live their own lives. But the spousal relationship has to take priority over the parent-child relationship. Now, here's where that fits in. Here's our point today. This is the only point I want to make. Key takeaways. Number one, in your life, adore God first. This is your most important relationship. This is your most important relationship because God made you, God redeemed you, and you answered to God for what you did with your life on earth. Your relationship with God is the one that lasts forever. Here's what we believe. Everyone spends eternity somewhere. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can spend eternity with God in heaven in His glory Gazing on his face for eternity. That's what we were made for. That's the glory emptiness we long to have fulfilled. And it will happen. So adore God first with your life. This teaches you humility. Second, adore your spouse second. Kids don't come second. Spouse comes second. Now, for those of you who say, but I'm not with my ex anymore and we are still trying to figure out how to raise these kids, then you still speak of them with great respect and humility. You still practice humility and consider them more important than you. For those of you who are still married, you adore your spouse, not your children second. Now, in a home where parents adore God first and adore spouse second, do you know what that does for the environment in the home? It makes it consistent. And it makes it safe. It allows a child to look up and say, my dad follows Jesus, and Jesus is good. Everything is safe. My mom loves Jesus, and Jesus is good. Everything is safe. My mom and my dad, they love each other. Everything is safe. This creates the consistent environment that allows children to thrive. Adore God first. Adore spouse second, kids come third. Some would say, but then they will feel unloved. No, they won't. They will feel safe, and they will feel secure, and they will feel loved being in an environment where there is this much adoration going on. Adore God first, adore your spouse second, kids come third. That's the consistent environment. Where humility thrives, and where humility thrives, kids can thrive in social competence and emotional resilience, and that's what leads to healthy adulting. Remember, next week, we're going to talk about choices and consequences, so we'll pick it up there next Sunday. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wisdom in the Scriptures. But for so many of us, we think to ourselves, if only I had known this earlier, if, if only I had practiced this earlier. Jesus, help us to see that although you always took the standard higher, you do take the grace deeper every day of our lives. Help us to see that you don't condemn us for our failure. That's why you died for us. You embraced humility. You considered our needs ahead of your own. And you humbled yourself to death on a cross to make us children of God. Help us find our identity and our security in you alone. Father, for, for parents who have regrets in this area, I ask that wherever they're at, they can take a step towards their ideal family today and have the courage to follow you into that. For parents who are still in this or who are approaching this, I ask that this wisdom will be put into practice through true humility that comes from following you. Wherever this lands for us, 
Help us all to adore you first, Jesus, because you love us so much. And if we're married, to adore our, adore our spouses second. This glorifies you, and it's good for us, and it's critical for the next generation. Give us your strength in Jesus' name. Amen.